Hey friends, my name is Steve Guttenberg and I am the Audiophiliac. And today's show is, well, it's what drives us crazy. What drives audiophiles crazy and maybe how we can be less crazy. How we can like get past this. That's hopefully the payoff to this. But I'm going to start, oh, and there will be an Audiophiliac viewer system of the day later on in today's show. Just yeah. Anyway, what drives us crazy? I'm going to start with what drives me crazy, and then I'm going to get to what, what you guys have told me on Twitter and Facebook and other places. But for me, I'm going to give you the number one thing. First, I'm going to start with the biggie. So for eight years, I owned quad ESL 63 speakers, electrostatic speakers, really phenomenal speakers. And I kept them for eight years because I basically did like them. But here's the thing that was getting to me that was eventually driving me crazy. So it was a little bit at a time. It was one of those kind of things, right? Was that quads are all about detail and transparency and a beautiful mid-range. And yeah, yeah, you know the drill, right? But here's the thing. They're not, at least for me, I can't speak for other people. They're not rock speakers. Now I'm not one to really play things, you know, really crank them or play loud or feel. I'm not that kind of person, but I do want to feel more than what the 63s could give me. So a little bit at a time, over time, over those eight years, I started to really resent the speakers, get frustrated with the speakers, and they were driving me crazy. And this is just as I was starting to become a reviewer. So I had other speakers coming through this room right here. And I started to realize that those other speakers that were not as uh, advanced as the quads were and the things that quads do well, but those other speakers were more fun. I would much rather listen to Led Zeppelin over a pair of Polk speakers than over the quad 63s. And that's when I realized it was time <laughs> for the 63s to go. And that journey where that went to, that's another video. <laughs> but I just want to say that that one, because you see the thing about the quads was that, and this is the driving me crazy part, is that they were basically steering me to play music that sounded good on quads to the exclusion of music that didn't sound good to me on quads. And I'm not speaking for you other quad owners out there, I'm just telling you my experience. So yeah, I was listening to music that sounded good on quads, but not the music necessarily I wanted to listen to at that moment. And if that isn't like top on the list of things that drive audiophiles crazy, yeah, I think it is. As a matter of fact, I just got an email from a guy who was saying, you know, I can't play my favorite music from the 60s and 70s because it doesn't sound good on my current system. It's variation on that same theme, right? That he needs to make a change and I think for him, and here's the solution part, at least in his, in his case, is to use an equalizer, and they come in all sizes and prices, but you know, the shit, shit now makes, S-C-H-I-T, shit now makes a whole range of equalizers. So yeah, if, you, if that fits your problem, yeah, maybe an equalizer is a pretty straight ahead fix. Okay. Another big one that drives people crazy, audiophiles crazy, is their room, right? It's too small, sometimes too big, but usually people complain that it's too small, that it's crowding their sound, you know? And that's a problem. That is a problem if you just feel that you, your system, your music would sound so much better in a bigger room than it does in your present room size. And I do have a solution for that. It's not a perfect solution, but it is something of a solution. And that is, if you have a small room and you probably have small speakers in your small room, get closer to your speakers. So if you're currently sitting seven feet away from your speakers, <laughs> sit five feet away from your speakers. The closer you get to your speakers, the bigger they sound. And I'm not joking, that's literally true. And the closer you get to your speakers, the more direct sound you'll get from your speakers and the ratio of reflected sound goes down. So it's kind of a win-win thing if you can pull that off and get closer. To whatever degree you can get closer, wherever you are, move your chair, move your, your sofa or your speakers 
and get closer and that can help. It's not gonna make your room any bigger, but it's gonna make the sound coming out of your speakers potentially, I'm not saying this is gonna work in every case, make your speakers sound better in your current room. Now, of course, continuing with the room issue, if you have a, a, a problem room and you think your solution would be uh, room correction in some electronic correction or room treatment, meaning diffusers, absorbers, or bass traps or something, sure, that, that could definitely help. But uh, tread gently on that whole room correction, <laughs> room treatment thing, because it does, in my experience, it doesn't work miracles. It's a, it's a I was gonna say band-aid, may, may not be the right word, but it's not a cure-all. It's not gonna make your room miraculously wonderful <laughs> if it isn't already, right? It's, I, there's one engineer I know who designs room correction systems for a living I had lunch with him a couple of years ago after he'd been doing it for 15 years or something. And I said something to him like, so what have you learned about room correction all this time you've been doing it? And his answer was perfect. He said, what I've learned is less is more. Don't <laughs> overdo the correction. Do minimal correction. And that's probably the best solution is not to think I can fix everything in my room with room correction or even room treatment. As always, experimentation is what's required. My friend Billy, who loves tube electronics, he said what drives him crazy about living with tubes is this uh, neurotic feeling you get that my tubes are wearing out, they're not as good as they were six months ago, and maybe it's time to replace the tubes, or, or they're expensive tubes, maybe I should hold off a bit. All that kind of stuff definitely can get to you. So I do have something of a check if you feel like your tubes have uh, gone past their, their useful life. And that is, you should have, where possible, if you can afford it, have two sets of tubes. Let's call it set A and set B, right? And when you get set A and set B, you compare them, you say, yeah, they sound pretty much the same. And then you use set A, and you have that in for six months, a year, two years. And then you're thinking, yeah, maybe it's time for them to go, and you compare set A to set B, and see if they still sound pretty close. If set A has definitely aged enough that it's not, not cutting it anymore, okay, now you go to set B. And then you get another set of tubes. In other words, you're rotating sets. But if let's say you compare set A to set B and they still sound the same or close enough, you go, yeah, these are good. And you just keep going that way. So it's not the perfect solution, but it's a possible solution depending on your circumstances. Oh, this one comes from Jake. Jake said his problem is, is that his old room, he moved recently, his old room sounds better than his current room, and that's driving him crazy, and that must be a toughie. That's really hard. You had a room that was really rocking, and everything was great. You moved to your new house or apartment, and now it's not so good anymore. That's tough. Now, again, in terms of something of a workaround solution is make adjustments where possible, right? Maybe your new speakers, your speakers aren't really clicking with your new room. Maybe it's just, you just need new speakers, right? Or of course, always room placement strategies come into play. But yeah, if your old place was better than your new, that's an issue, definitely. And then the other that's sort of related to this in a way is that one upgrade leads to another upgrade. That's not good, yeah. Yeah, you got a new set of cables, but now you want a new, you want a power line conditioner. You got a power line conditioner, maybe, in, yeah, one leads to the next. That's not good, and that definitely could make you a little nutty. Here's a good problem that Stephen wrote in and said one recording leads to the next. He listens to one, he wants to listen to another, wants to listen to another. That's, that's kind of a good one to have, right? That's a good kind of problem. Your system's clicking, you love your music, you just want to hear more and more of it. That's nice. I, I wish we all had that problem. And then, of course, there's the problem of, of your entire music collection, whether it's LP, CD, or streaming, that the quality of the recording itself, the sound quality of the recordings, isn't consistent. That's not good. This is a deeper problem, and that is not knowing what good is. You don't know if your system is good or how good it is even. Yeah, that's... That's a toughie because if you don't know what you're looking for, <laughs> chances are you're not going to find it, and that's not a good place to be. So uh, the only fix for that is to have more experience listening to well, different speakers, different amplifiers, different turntables, whatever your, your fancy is, right? But you have to 
learn how to listen. You have to have the experience and become basically a better listener to understand not just what good is, but what it is that you are looking for. Some people, you know, are obsessed or focused on flat frequency response or a nice tonal balance. Other people want real big dynamics or kick-ass bass. You know, it's different things for different people. So, you know, it's a tired cliche, but there is no one size fits all for what someone would call good sound. It's more complicated than that. One guy said his thing that drove him crazy was that his cats use his speakers as scratching posts. And one time a claw went through a driver, you know, just like, you know, done. <laughs> that's, that's, a, that's a toughie. Yeah, you get a new driver and, and move on, move on, right? Uh, then there was the guy who wrote in to say that he, what's driving him crazy is he's in the market to buy new speakers. And the good news is he has some dealers that are close enough he can go from shop to shop and listen to different speakers. But he wishes he could hear all the speakers in one place. And there is no workaround for that problem. Now, I did suggest that kind of a workaround is to bring at least his amplifier, if that's possible, to each store so that there's some consistency there that he's hearing his amp driving these different speakers. And of course, whenever you go shopping, if you're lucky enough to go to brick and mortar stores, uh, bring music that you know with you in whatever form, LP, CD, whatever, so that you can always listen to the same music when you're doing your auditions. That is absolutely a number one requirement, I would say, is to always at least play the same music and play it at approximately the same volume level from place to place. That can really make a difference. It's not perfect, but it could help. Now, I just, I just talked about this recently, but your system sounds different on different days. Now, some people, you know, comment that their system always sounds the same. And some people said, yeah, it sounds great on one day and then the next and then really bad two weeks later. We talked about that in that other video I just did. No, oh, then there was the guy who, who wrote in to talk about his chaotic cable situation. And just too many cables, a rat's nest of wires, and it was driving him crazy. I, I don't have that problem. I, don't, I have a lot of cables, a lot of cables, but I don't know. It doesn't bother me. But obviously it bothers a lot of people, and that's why some people move towards wireless systems. Of course, there was the guy who wrote and said, here's my problem. I need more money to buy audio. Well, yeah, I guess that's a, that's a common problem. It's so common that most people didn't even refer to it. But sure, depending on your appetite for more and better audio, money could be an issue. So yes, and I don't have a fix for that. I'm sorry. Dennis, my pal Dennis wrote in to say standing waves. Yes. Standing waves can be a huge problem. My, my, my last apartment in New York City in, in Manhattan had a big standing wave problem, and that's a tough one to get around. Standing waves meaning you have boomy bass, or there's too much bass in one part of your room and not enough bass in another part of your room. It's a, it really is a problem, and again, my only kind of solution for that is getting closer to your speakers, getting your speakers away from the walls, Near field listening can really make a difference in, in rooms that have that problem. And the other thing I tried in my old uh, Manhattan apartment was not having the speakers set up, you know, on a wall, but sort of catty corner, you know, like diagonal situation. And that, so I was sitting in this weird position, but it did help to some degree. And I'll, I'll just put up a picture of what that looks like. But anyway, so standing waves are an issue. I don't really think that room correction is going to really overcome something as problematic is that. You know, I'm not so sure that room correction can make that big a difference for the standing wave issue, but, you know, give it a shot. When, <laughs> when you have limited uh, choices, you, you go with your limited choices. Victor wrote in and said that he, he regrets, he has his regrets, and he regrets selling his Marantz Model 8. He wishes he had it back. He can't afford to buy another one, so that's something. I'm going to end on a high note, though. My friend Jonathan wrote in to say, he had, he, nothing makes him crazy. He's perfectly happy with the sound of his system and his music. So some of us are just lucky that way. <laughs> so now it is that special time for the Audiophiliac Viewer System of the Day. 
This one comes from Michael. He lives in Belgium. He's been into Hi-Fi since 1976, and this is his current system. That very cool looking amplifier is a Magnat RV3 hybrid, 150 watts channel in stereo. The speakers are Swan Diva 6.1. He has two CD players, actually this first one, the Shanling SCD T200C is an SACD player. And then there's a TIAC VRDS T, which is a transport. The vinyl is played on an Audio Block PS100. It's a turntable, but I've never heard of that one before. And the power conditioner is by Belkin. It's a pure AV filter protector. He's planning upgrades. Michael is planning upgrades at Denifrep's DAC, probably the Venus, and some high efficiency speakers from Zoo or Tannoy. He also has his eye on a line magnetic tube amp, the LM219IA or the LM210IA. Michael grew up with the likes of Deep Purple, Yes, King Crimson, you get the picture. And over the years, he's progressed as is his words, to blues, jazz, lounge. He listens to a lot of Sinatra. Hey, I know the feeling. <laughs> anyway, uh, it's a nice system. Good luck to you, Michael. Thanks for sending this in. We are back. My name is Steve Guttenberg, and I am the Audiophiliac. If you like these videos that I'm putting up, uh, please hit the like button. I would appreciate it. It's right down there, right below this video. Uh, and I don't know if you've noticed, I've said it a couple times, I've mentioned it here and there, but I have a new thing, the Audiophiliac Podcast, which is not the same thing as this show. It's completely different topics, different subject. It's not just audio-only versions of my videos. No, it's completely original material. And you can hear my podcasts on Apple Podcasts, on Spotify, on Google Podcasts, a whole bunch of places. It's all over the internet. Matter of fact, if you're not into the podcast thing, you can just go to my website, which is conveniently called uh, Audiophiliac Podcast, and there's a link to that directly below. And if you'd like to support the show, here's how to do it. Check out my Patreon, which can be found at p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com slash audiophiliac, and there is a link to that as well directly below. And, and Patreon now accepts payment in dollars, pounds, and euros. And with that, I can now say my work here is at last complete. Thank you again for watching, and I really do hope to see you back here again very, very soon. Bye-bye.